Hello and welcome to our sixth exercise in reinforcement learning. This is Max speaking and today we will be dealing with n-step methods. In the past two exercises we were dealing with Monte Carlo and temporal difference learning and now n-step methods kind of unify these two learning principles. When using Monte Carlo learning we had to wait until the end of an episode until we were able to learn. The upside of this was that we were able to accumulate the whole available return until then and take this into account for the learning step. In contrast to that, temporal difference methods learn after every step but also can take into account only the return after every step, so only the actual momentary reward. In between these two extremes there are the n-step methods. In n-step methods we can decide ourselves if we want to learn after one step or after the end of the episode or even something arbitrarily in between, maybe after five steps, after ten steps and so on and so forth. Hence n-step methods are an abstraction of the previously discussed Monte Carlo and temporal difference methods and include these uh, methods as special cases. Previously we were dealing with the racetrack environment but we have seen enough from that and now we want to have a look at a different environment, namely the inverted pendulum from the OpenAI gym environments collection. You can already see the inverted pendulum over here. The task will be to balance the pendulum in the upright middle position. In order to be able to make use of this environment, please make sure that you install the gym library in beforehand. If the installation has been performed correctly, the import of the gym library should be as simple as seen here. And if you execute the next cell, you should be able to see the gym window where the pendulum is shown and some random actions are performed on this environment. As I said before, we want to bring the pendulum into the upright neutral position, which is defined by an angle theta equals zero and an angular velocity omega that also equals zero. The reward for this environment was specifically designed to reach this conditions so we do not need to tune the reward any further. That's it about the environment for the moment, so let's have a look at the first task. Before we can actually use one of our reinforcement learning agents on this environment, we need to discretize the action and the state space. The inverted pendulum from the gym environments is defined on a continuous action space and a continuous state space and th this is not compatible with the agents that we learned to know so far. So we need to define a discrete state space and a discrete action space so that we can use our discreetly working reinforcement learning agents and put them to use also on this environment. The state representation that we get from this environment can be seen here. So we get the cosine, the sine and the angular velocity of the pendulum and all of these are defined on these intervals here. The input variable that we can control externally is the torque that is applied to the axis of rotation of this pendulum, which is also clipped in this interval. And now we need to define a discretized state function that allows us to put this continuous state into this discrete state. We also define a discrete action, however we do not need a function that discretizes the action because the output of the agent will be discretized inherently, but we need a function that continualizes the action. So we give it to this function the discrete action and the continualization will give us the according continuous value. You can see that the number of discretization intervals is given here by the parameters d theta, d omega and dt and we also ask the question whether these parameters should be chosen to be specifically odd or specifically even numbers. Let's have a look at the solution. I won't be going over the code in detail this time. Please have a look at it yourself, try to understand it and ask questions if necessary. The number of discretization intervals that we can choose does in fact make a difference, so we need to decide whether to choose it to an odd or an even number. The reason for this can be seen here. This is the actual neutral position that we want to bring the pendulum into. 
If we assume that the pendulum arrived in the upper neutral position, we want to be able to accurately discretize this neutral position as well. And this is only possible if we choose to use an odd number of discretization intervals. The reason can be seen when looking at the discretization diagrams for our discretization process. Specifically for this video, I included these discretization diagrams and here you can see which continuous state will be mapped to which discrete state. In the neutral position, theta will be equal to zero, so cosine of zero will be one. That means that in the neutral position, the cosine will be discretized in this interval. So the discretization of the cosine in the neutral position will be always well defined, no matter if we use the odd or the even number of discretization intervals. However, the sine of zero will, will of course also be zero. And in order to have a clear mapping from zero in the continuous state to the discrete state, we need to make use of an odd number of discretization intervals. If I plot this diagram again for an even number of discretization intervals, you see that for the cosine the problem does not occur. However, for the sine we see that now the zero continuous state lies exactly on the boundary of two discretization intervals and this will make it hard to detect the neutral position once we arrived there. The same problem can occur for omega, so the angular velocity. Here also the plot shown for an odd number of discretization intervals. And also for the applied torque, we want to use an odd number of discretization intervals. As you can see, we want to put it that way so that one discrete action will be mapped to the continuous action of zero applied torque. So let's now have a look at task number two, where we will be actually dealing with n-step Sasa. The environment is given and the discretization was successful, and so we should be able to implement a good learning agent for this. The major difficulty of this task will maybe come from the fact that there will be no code template given. However, I hope that nobody felt discouraged by that and still tried to make an attempt to solve this problem. Again, try to read and understand the code by yourself. And if you want to try to run this solution script on your own machine, be aware that there is this render command here that allows to show the graphical representation of this inverted pendulum. However, this makes the code run slower, so you maybe want to comment it out. Running the code should not take too long. And then if we have a look at the reward history, that we can interpret as the learning curve in this example, we see that the learning actually works quite good. So let's now also have a look at the policy that we gain out of this. So that's why we have this cell for greedy execution here. If I run the policy with greedy execution, we see that actually a good behavior was learned and we are able to stabilize the inverted pendulum in the upper neutral position. Feel free to try n in a different way, so choose different numbers for the number of steps before we can start to learn from our experiences and see whether this changes our resulting policy in the end. So now let's have a look at task number three. In task number three, we want to implement the n steps ASA with tree backups. So this is an off policy algorithm now. If you use on policy training on physical test benches or test tricks, we might get problems because the policy is initially not good enough to control the system in safe operation points. It might happen that we steer the system into points of unsafe uh, operation and that's of course not desired and so off policy solutions are a good way to ensure that we stay in a good operating point. Unfortunately, it will take a little time until we learn something of policy. As you can see here, we need to train it for 10,000 episodes in order to yield sufficient results. However, I hope that you are able to try it anyway and see if you can get a good policy in the end. I now ran this algorithm in advance. So let's have a look at the reward history. 
And as you can see, this is what we expected. We used the behavior policy that was pre-trained and accordingly the reward we collect in each episode is quite okay or actually pretty good as we can see here. This is quite a critical reason for the use of off policy methods because if we for example tie the reward system to safe operation points or some cost system to unsafe operation points then a low reward would mean that we control the system in the points of unsafe operation. And if you can see here, we have a higher reward for the whole training process. So we could imagine this policy would be able to control the system more safely. And of course, our behavior policy also implements a little bit of pre-knowledge about our system. So we would now expect that our learn policy also is quite good on the system. So let's have a look how our learn policy will perform. I execute the greedy execution and we see, no, it really is not very good. I will run it a few more times, but we see that the policy does not behave very good on the environment. The result cannot be observed to be sufficiently good. So now we have to ask the question, why did it happen? Although our behavior policy was so good during all the training episodes. The reason for this problem can be found when having a look at the initialization of the tree branching algorithm. As you can see here, I initialized the action values with zeros, which means that we also used an optimistic initialization in this scenario. The problem is now, that our behavior policy does not look at the action values when determining the next action. Our learn policy, however, sees that the action values are set to zero and now tries to make use of this when being applied. In the end, this means that there are some state transitions that are never used by the behavior policy, but due to the optimistic initialization here, the learn policy will try to use them if we apply it greedily. So we have a problem because we use paths that we have never seen during training. We can solve this issue by initializing this more pessimistically, giving it a large negative initial action state so that the paths that are actually taken by the behavior policy will show higher rewards and consequently the action values that we observe during training will be better than the action values that we initialize here. After running the algorithm again with a more pes pessimistic initialization, we again see that the rewards were rather good through all the training episodes. So as it was to be expected, changing the initialization to pessimistic has not had an influence on the training performance as can be seen here. Now let's have a look at the performance on the actual environment when using the learn policy. And we see that this time actually the learning was successful and the pendulum can be stabilized or nearly stabilized in the upper neutral position. Lastly, let's have a look at task number four an n-step Q-sigma hyperparameter optimization. In this task, we want to have a look at the Q-sigma algorithm, where we not only have the number of steps that we want to include into the update step, but moreover, we have the parameter sigma that lets us decide in how far we want to wait the update concerning the sample trajectory or an expected trajectory. So this means we have more parameters that we need to choose which adds flexibility to this algorithm, but also we need to choose the, the parameters in the correct way to make use of this flexibility. This is why we want to carry out a small hyperparameter optimization. So we want to optimize our algorithm so that we can ch choose n and sigma in a good way. The optimization algorithm will in this case be not as complicated as gradient descent, but we will only use a simple grid search to determine the optimum. Another degree of freedom that one could use is to change sigma in every time step. However, this would make the problem even more complicated 
so we choose to use a constant sigma for one training run here. The points in the n sigma plane are given as of here, and you can see that this will in fact take a while to be computed. Moreover, we have to think about how we could evaluate a training process. We need to grade it in some way or with th some metric so that we can differentiate a good learning behavior from a bad learning behavior. Of course, one could choose to also optimize the other parameters of the algorithm configuration. However, this would make the problem even more lengthy and thus we didn't want to tackle this problem in an exercise like this. Let's have a short look at the algorithm. As I said before, we could choose to make use of the degree of freedom to choose sigma in every time step. However, we will not make use of this and just assume sigma to be constant for one training run. Moreover, there is this row that is given by pi over b, so the probability to choose an action within our greedy policy over the probability to choose an action within our behavior policy. As pi is pure greedy, pi is either 1 or 0, b however is epsilon greedy, so there are two possibilities which probability b could be. It's either a high probability that represents the exploitative action or a low probability that represents the explorative action. Essentially, this is nothing else but important sampling. Over here, the value function is calculated by taking the expected value over all actions from the action value. However, if we assume pi to be greedy, there's only one possible action in each state that has a probability of 1, and all the other actions will have a probability of 0. So essentially, only one action value has to be considered to calculate the state value here. Of course, the same applies in this equation. I think there is nothing more to explain about the task and the algorithm, so let's have a look at the solution of the task. Again, I will not talk so much about the code, but only interpret the results. For an easier integration into the hyperparameter optimization, this time I defined the Q-sigma algorithm as a function, so we can pass n and sigma parameters to this function, and in the end we will get a policy and a reward history returned. In order to collect the necessary data for our hyperparameter optimization, this short script here will carry out the grid search, so all the possible combinations of the n and sigma parameter are tried out, and their performance is written into an array, a two-dimensional array named performances. For this, of course, it is important to look at how I define performance here, and in this case I define performance as the sum over the reward history. This can be basically understood as an integral, and the larger this integral is, the faster our algorithm learned. Of course, this is not the only possible metric one could apply here. There can be a lot of more interesting things one could look at during the training process. One can be creative here. As you can see, this grid search in fact took a while, and in the end, this performance matrix was the result. In my convention, the n parameter increases with the rows and the sigma parameter increases with the columns. However, the numbers here are so lengthy that the columns are not clearly shown next to each other. So let's have a look at it in a more structured way. It should be easier to view it now. And here we can see that this cell shows us the best performance that occurred during this optimization. So as I just said, increasing rows means we are increasing n, and increasing the columns means that we are increasing sigma. So for example at this cell we would have n equals 10 and sigma equals 1, and accordingly for this cell we would have n equals 10 and sigma equals 0. So as it seems n equal to 10 and sigma equal to 0 is actually a quite good choice for the parameters in this example, but of course we are not satisfied with just seeing this result, we also want to explain it. So why is n equals 10 and sigma equals 0 a good choice? Why is the optimal cell here on the outer corner of the matrix and not 
somewhere in the middle in between here. So by choosing n, we can decide how long we will collect information about the return before we start to learn. Collecting more returns sounds good on paper. However, we cannot be sure that rewards of the far future give much information about the action we should take immediately. As it seems in our example, this is a quite a good choice. And um, the tendency even shows that there might be that it might be even better to choose an n even higher than 10. The sigma parameter lets us choose whether we want to learn based on the sample trajectory or if we want to learn based on the ex expected trajectory. And now with sigma equals zero, we are purely laying our focus on the expected trajectory. We cannot be entirely sure why this result was yielded in this scenario. It is possible that relying on expected transitions allows the agent to avoid the problems that may come when using important sampling. This problem was already presented in the fourth lecture where important sampling was introduced. We have seen that important sampling comes with high variance which decreases the initial performance. But as I said, this is only an assumption and we should not rely on this explanation being correct. So let's finally have a look at the resulting policy. I ran another training algorithm in advance with the found hyperparameter choice of n equals 10 and sigma equals 0. And as we can see here, the training, the reward history looks quite okay, but also has some degree of variance still present as we can see in this down peaks here. Let's have a look at the policy performance by example. And we see the policy mainly does what we want it to do, but it seems to be not that fast when doing it. Let's run one longer example episode. And we see that the swing up uh, takes quite some time here, which is of course not what is desired. But as long as it works, it's an acceptable result at least. Of course, one could improve the performance of the training process even further by having a look at the other parameters that one could have a look at here and also base the hyperparameter optimization on them and then have a larger grid search or even have a look at different optimization methods here. Okay then. That's it for exercise number six. I hope everything was understandable. Thank you for listening. Take care and cheers.